Hi, I'm Ashley and I am going to present Protecting the Privacy of Voters, New Definitions of Ballot Secrecy for E-Voting. And this is joint work with Elizabeth Quigley. So in this work, we presented three new definitions of ballot secrecy, which is a minimal privacy requirement for electronic voting schemes. And I will define it formally later in this talk. We begin with an intuitive definition in the honest setting and then build upon this to provide two further definitions that capture a stronger attacker model. We then show that our definitions are satisfiable and that they can be applied to real implemented voting schemes. And finally, given that there are a lot of existing definitions of ballot secrecy, we briefly compare our definitions with existing work in this space and demonstrate the value of our definitions. Okay, so in this talk I'll give an overview of these results, but first let's define some terminology. So electronic voting or e-voting as it's more commonly known can mean different things depending on the context. It may mean simply that electronic aids are used at some point during the election, uh, for example, the use of machines to scan ballots and automate the tallying process, or the use of machines by voters to cast a ballot. But sometimes um, e-voting refers specifically to internet voting, where voters can, at least in theory, vote from anywhere in the world. So internet voting is the context of this talk. Now there's a number of different implemented systems, for example, Helios, Bellinios, Civitas, and e-voting has been used in real elections. And as with any cryptographic protocol, uh, e-voting schemes should satisfy some notion of security. Usually for e-voting, the main properties required are privacy and verifiability. And privacy ensures that voters can cast their vote in secret, and at its most basic level, it's defined as ballot secrecy the subject of this talk, but there are stronger notions such as receipt freeness and coercion resistance. Another basic property of e-voting schemes is verifiability, by which any interested party can check that the result of the election is computed correctly. Though, again, for the purposes of this talk, we restrict discussion to ballot secrecy. Okay, so I'll now describe a typical e-voting scheme in our syntax before discussing what it means for such a scheme to intuitively satisfy ballot secrecy. Okay, so following some setup, voters are registered to vote. Typically, they will obtain credentials from a registration authority, known as the registrar. Then during the voting phase, voters submit ballots that are linked to their credentials to the ballot box. Uh, for example, this might mean that a voter submits an encryption of their vote, encrypted under the public key of Italia, and produces a signature with the credentials supplied by the registrar. Now, the ballot box is managed by the suitably named ballot box manager, and they process the ballots received by the voters and provide a public view of the ballot box, which is known as the bulletin board. And following the voting phase of an election, the contents of the ballot box are passed to the tallier who computes and publishes the result of the election. So intuitively, ballot secrecy is the property that a voter's vote remains secret throughout the election, except when the result of the election reveals the vote, for example, in the event of a unanimous result. We capture this property in our formal definitions through an indistinguishability experiment and we use a notion of indistinguishability presented by Benelow and Young in their 1986 definition of ballot secrecy. So we capture the following game. Um, consider two voters, voter A and voter B. Now, depending on the value of a coin flip, either voter A votes zero and voter B votes one, or the votes are switched for the two voters. The election proceeds as usual and the result is announced. Now this game captures an adversary that attempts to distinguish these two voting patterns when they're provided with the result and the view of the public bulletin board corresponding to the coin value. Okay. 
So that's palette secrecy. Now with respect to the attacker models and our definitions, we consider a number of different potential attack scenarios. Okay, first, voters are either honest or corrupt. This means that we assume the attacker can corrupt a subset of voters, which means that they obtain the voters' credential and can essentially act on the voters' behalf. The remaining voters are honest and they are assumed to follow the scheme specification. This attacker model is known as the honest model. Now, corrupt election officials can lead to breaks of ballot secrecy. For instance, a malicious ballot box can stuff itself with ballots, which can actually change the result and possibly reveal the votes of honest voters. Therefore, we consider that the attacker can also control the ballot box in addition to a subset of voters, and we call this the malicious ballot box setting. And finally, a dishonest tallyer can have devastating consequences for ballot secrecy. Now, a malicious tallyer can potentially decrypt all ballots, reviewing the votes of all voters. And to mitigate against this, Many schemes consider the tallyer to be distributed and require that a threshold, or possibly all talliers, must be involved in the tallying process to output a result. This means that a majority of the talliers need to be corrupt in order to break the ballot secrecy property. Therefore, we finally consider that a subset of talliers are additionally corrupted, and we call this the distributed tallyer setting. Okay, so now we turn to our definitions and first we consider the honest model where all the election officials are uncorrupted and the attacker can corrupt a subset of voters. So we're going to capture this um, Benelow and Young intuition in a formal game-based indistinguishability experiment. And this is our experiment and the adversary can adaptively register and corrupt voters through Oracle Access, which was not shown on this slide, but you can see in the full version in their paper. Now, on behalf of corrupt voters, we model the fact that an attacker can act on their behalf through an Oracle cast. This Oracle allows the attacker to submit a ballot to the ballot box on behalf of the corrupt voter and ballots are appended to the ballot box if they pass some basic validity requirements. Then for honest voters, we capture our indistinguishability notion through an oracle vote. This oracle creates a ballot for an honest voter for one of two votes submitted by the adversary, uh, which depends on the value of a coin flip. Eventually, the adversary finishes querying the oracles contents of the ballot box are tallied and the result is returned to the adversary. If the adversary can guess about beta, they win. Okay. So we recall that the indistinguishability notion requires that there exists a counterbalance in voter. For example, if voter A votes 1, voter B votes 0 and vice versa. For our experiment, this means that we require the left and right hand queries to Oracle vote, so votes V0 and V1. They must be balanced. Uh, so a balancing condition is actually necessary here to prevent the adversary from trivially distinguishing the two possible views. So for example, an adversary can simply submit V0 equal to a vote for 0 and V1 equal to a vote for 1 on behalf of all honest voters, in which case the result will trivially reveal the value of beta. Okay. So we achieve this notion of balance by formalising it and requiring that the adversary queries oracle vote in such a way that the set of left and right hand queries are identical when the view is multi-sets. Otherwise we define uh, ballot secrecy such that the adversary cannot succeed. Okay. So the, our definition of ballot secrecy and the way in which we define our balancing condition captures some interesting properties. Now, firstly, our definition is re-voting friendly 
and we allow the adversary to submit any number of queries to Oracle's vote and cast on behalf of voters. Okay. So this means that we must update the contents of sets V0 and V1 uh, following an Oracle query to ensure that the adversary can't satisfy the balancing condition but trivially distinguish the two views based on the election result. And in our paper we explain for example how this is achieved. Now in the experiment as we presented it here on the slides we've implemented a last vote counts policy so we ensure that the sets V0 and V1 contain only the last vote uh, posted for each honest voter. In other words, the sets only contain votes that are counted in the result. And this uh, can be easily changed to other re-voting policies. And secondly, we model adaptive voter corruption for schemes that require voter registration. Uh, to model this, we allow the adversary to corrupt voters and query Oracle cast on behalf of corrupted voters, even if the adversary has previously submitted a query to Oracle vote on behalf of the voter. And again, we need to update our sets to prevent trivial distinctions. So this uh, combination of revoting and uh, adaptive corruption of voters has not been captured in any previous existing game-based definition of ballot secrecy. Definitions for schemes with uh, voter registration typically only allow static corruption of voters or they do not model revoting. However, we've managed to do both by carefully defining and ups updating sets V0 and V1. So we've modelled the realistic attack scenario of adaptive voter corruption for schemes that allow revoting with voter registration. Okay. So we'll now define ballot secrecy where the attacker fully controls the ballot box in addition to a subset of voters. Now this is very similar to our definition in the honest model and it captures the same indistinguishability notion. But we define an experiment in which the adversary constructs the ballot box themselves. So as in our honest model definition we capture the indistinguishability notion through an oracle vote. However, because the adversary constructs the ballot box, um, the oracle returns the ballot to the adversary rather than appending it to the ballot box. And the adversary can choose whether to append the honest voter's ballot to the ballot box, or they could drop the ballot completely, or they could perhaps modify the ballot before appending it. Now, on behalf of corrupt voters, the adversary appends ballots to the ballot box directly and we don't need an oracle cast to do this. Now, eventually, the adversary outputs the ballot box and contents are tallied and the result is returned to the adversary. If the adversary can guess the bit beta, they win. We require a balancing condition to hold, as before to prevent these trivial distinctions and um, we construct a balancing condition such as such that the sets V0 and V1 only contain ballots for honest voters that are both po posted to the ballot box and included in the result. Now, as before our definition is re-voting friendly and we model a last vote counts re-vote policy. However there are a couple of restrictions Firstly, this definition, the definition in the malicious ballot box setting, only captures static corruption of voters. It turns out that if our definition allowed adaptive corruption, the adversary could append ballots to the ballot box in a way that the balancing condition holds, but the adversary can trivially distinguish based on the election result. Now, this is actually in line with all other definitions of ballot secrecy in the malicious ballot box model. Uh, no other definition captures adaptive voter corruption for schemes with voter registration. Okay. 
Secondly, we require that ballots are non-malleable to satisfy our definition. Uh, otherwise, trivial attacks are possible, as in the previous case. Though this may seem like a limitation, we believe that, in fact, non-malleable ballots are desirable. So, for example, if a ballot includes a malleable element, an attacker with control of the ballot box can modify this element, potentially ensuring that a ballot is not included in the result of the election or possibly allowing the adversary to break the ballot secrecy property. Furthermore, though there exist some ballots that include ma malleable elements, for example timestamps, these ballots can be modified to ensure non-malleability. For instance, um, a ballot with a, mod a malleable element can be appended with a signature or proof of knowledge that, ta that is tied to the malleable element. And this ensures that the malleable element cannot be modified without detection. And this in turn ensures that a modified ballot is not ba valid and will not be included in the election result. Okay, so this brings us to our final definition with a distributed tallyer. This is very similar to our definition in the malicious ballot box model and we simply make a couple of changes to our previous definition. So firstly, the experiment is parameterized by n and t, which are the total number of talliers and the number of talliers required to compute the result, respectively. Then the adversary selects a set of t-1 talliers that they want to corrupt and obtains their secret keys. Uh, just to be clear at this stage, we don't actually allow the attacker to generate the key material on behalf of the corrupt talliers, but simply supply the attacker with the key material and it's assumed that the keys are generated according to the protocol specification, specification in the same way that uh, voters' credentials are computed honestly. Okay. So then the election tally is computed using the T-1 keys that are requested by the adversary plus an additional tally or key. So because the definition is so similar to the malicious ballot box definition, uh, we obtain many of the same features, including the fact that we are re-voting friendly, allow static voter corruption and require non-malleable ballots. Now, on the face of it, this appears to be quite a simplistic extension, but this is actually the first game-based definition to consider a malicious ballot box and a malicious subset of talliers. And we believe that this is an important step forward towards definitions that capture realistic trust assumptions. We'd also just like to say that, um, as previously mentioned, it is common to distribute the role of the tallier to mitigate against potentially devastating attacks. However, though there are many schemes that are implemented with a distributed tallier, the ballot secrecy security proof often models the tallier as a single trusted entity. And our definition, on the other hand, allows for security proofs that mirror uh, the real life assumptions. Okay, so our second contribution was that we prove satisfiability of our definitions. We do this by defining an e voting scheme, uh, which is based on the mini vote construction of Bernard et al. So our construction is based on standard cryptographic primitives, um, a homomorphic public key encryption scheme, signature of knowledge, and we assume that the credential pairs of voters are generated by a one-way function. Okay, so voters produce ballots that are, in, are an encryption of the vote choice and a corresponding signature of knowledge. The ballots are homomorphically tallied and the homomorphic ciphertext is decrypted to give the election result. So we show that our construction is secure in the honest setting and the malicious ballot box setting uh, based on standard security motions for the underlying primitives. And we then show by simply replacing the public key encryption with threshold public key encryption we, provide, we can provide a simple construction that is secure in the distributed tallier setting. Okay. 
Now, our constructions are, they don't model the verification process. And if you recall from the introduction of this talk, verification is an important security requirement of e-voting schemes, but our constructions can be easily extended to fully verifiable and practical e-voting schemes, and we can prove them to be secure based on the fact that the underlying non-verifiable construction is secure. So, in the literature, there are a number of definitions of ballot secrecy. And ours are based on the approach of Benham and Young, and they're very similar to definitions by Bernard and Smith, uh, who also implement the Benham and Young notion of indistinguishability. The difference is that our definitions model schemes with voter registration and adaptive voter corruption which is not captured by any of the previous definitions and as we showed uh, this model uh, requires careful consideration of the balancing condition in order to prevent trivial attacks and model schemes with free voting policies. So our definitions and those in the preceding works that I've mentioned are different to a line of research that departed from the Benelow and Young approach and resulted in the definition of BPRIV, which is a well-established and highly regarded definition of ballot secrecy. But we chose not to follow the BPRIV line of work because the approach taken in our work offers advantages with respect to extendability. So we've shown that our definition in the honest model can be extended in an intuitive way to the malicious setting, so capturing malicious ballot box managers and uh, tallyers. But BPREV, on the other hand, it doesn't extend well to the malicious setting, and because that was a primary aim of this work, uh, we considered it worthwhile to revisit the Benelow and Young approach, which allows for intuitive, easy to understand definitions. However, um, for transparency, we point out a limitation in our definitions that is avoided by BPREF. So we limit the class of result functions that can be considered. So our definitions and those the other ones that use the Ben and Young approach. Uh, they don't capture result functions that allow for different vote assignments that lead to the same result. And this is a direct consequence of the balancing condition that's required. Uh, so we require the vote assignments for left and right hand queries to Oracle vote to balance. Um, but despite this, we, we do capture common result functions such as plurality voting, which is commonly known as first past post. Okay. So then, what does this all mean with respect to future work on ballot secrecy definitions? Now, we believe that to model realistic attack scenarios, the way forward is ballot secrecy definitions that capture corrupted election officials. In practice, it is hard to achieve the trust assumptions that we make in the honest model and formal definitions of ballot secrecy in the malicious setting ensure that we can provide formal proofs of security under realistic trust assumptions. Now, ideally, these strong security notions will have gen generic applicability. In other words, the definitions will not restrict the class of voting schemes that can be considered. However, we know that it's difficult to extend a generic definition such as BPREV to capture stronger attack models. And we believe that our definitions are simple to understand and it is easy to reason about trust assumptions mm -hmm. within our model. Therefore, we believe that they provide a springboard for future research in the direction of realistic trust assumptions. And this concludes this talk, and thank you for listening.